Thank you very much, Christian, for, for being today okay. with us. And thank you, everybody, for attending this new meeting on the Finance Online Seminars. And today, we're going to talk about the, the efficient market hypothesis. And uh, uh, Christian Walter will talk about, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the efficient market hypothesis. And the title of his uh, 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 talk is The Two Quantifications of Financial Theory, a Toy Model. And so th thanks again, Christian, for being here today and uh, with us. And now you can you can start. And uh, we are um, looking forward to to listening to your talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Emiliano. Thank you for um, hello everybody. Um, but I just would like to to give you a talk about uh, a well known and celebrated. Uh, efficient market hypothesis, just to be able to understand something uh, I think is not quite really understood in general, is the equivalence between the two mathematical frameworks of uh, EMH. I mean, the, the classical framework with mean variance uh, universe, Markowitz of 1962, and the more modern framework, uh, meaning the Martingale pricing universe of Harrison, Krebs, and Pliska with the risk neutral probability Q. So we have for describing uh, markets with uh, equilibrium, two mathematical frameworks. One could be named the old one, and the second could be named the modern one. And these two frameworks can be thought as uh, two representations of the efficient market hypothesis, EMH, based on a given specific representation using mathematical tools. So in general, in British Russia, it's not very well known and well understood. And sometimes a lot of debates or controversies about the EMH in, the, for example, the history of financial thought or uh, philosophical literature, are dealing with the old way of thinking the EMH and not the new and modern way of thinking AMH. So what I would like to do is just to, to be able to, and to show the way of moving from the old framework to the new framework, because this, this could be useful for non-specialists and non-experts to very well and to precisely understand what is exactly uh, embedded in the notion of efficient market hypothesis. So this is the main objective of the paper. The first version was represented in Roma at a very uh, fascinating uh, seminar, the first finance on la seminar, first BNL conference seminar. So it's a new version of this paper. And uh, I take the opportunity to thank the participants of the conference of September for their questions and their comments. So this is, uh, and, and mainly Emiliano, <laughs> it's very, very nice and sympathetic events in this very uh, fascinating city of Roma. So, so the, the aim is the following, is just to present without any mathematical complexity, the toy model of the EMH. And the interest of a toy model is present is presently is uh, to be able to understand and to eliminate the correspondence between the multiple representations of the EMH based on the different frameworks. So the toy model will focus on the ma two main mathematical frameworks of EMH. What I said, the mean variance universe of Markowitz 
and the real probability, the real world probability P, not denoted P, and the Martingale pricing universe and the risk neutral probability denoted Q, P and Q. And these two mathematical frameworks can be thought as two quantification conventions in the sense uh, my colleague Ed Capello and myself uh, gave to this notion uh, for a sociological approach of financial markets. Um, what will be the epistemic gains of this kind of very simple toy image model? I think there are three epistemic gains. The first epistemic gains is uh, the model will be epistemically valuable for non-specialists and practitioners because uh, a lot of times the practitioners think they know the assumptions of their model, but practically it's not the case because of a, a mathematical barrier, a mathematical complexity of the background of the EA image view, mainly in the risk neutral world with probability Q. So even practitioners could find an interest to, to see how the e image precisely is precisely working. The second epistemic gain, uh, I think, is the precise, the deep understand of what is exactly the risk neutral pricing. I think it's very important for the today debates to be able to discuss e image and to debate about the e image mainly. Uh, for the ethical issues by using not the old fashioned framework of P world with mean variance universe of Markowitz and Sharp, but with the modern framework using the risk neutral pricing. But the risk neutral pricing, I think, is not very well understood by non specialists or non experts of uh, the financial markets. And the third epistemic gain will be the understanding of the passage, the way of moving from the P world to the Q world. And this movement is the key, in my opinion, of what is called the financialization of society and economy by the mathematics of finance. The key operator of uh, moving from the P world to the Q world is what is called the radon nicodine operator. And it's a very difficult mathematical concept. So the third epistemic gain of this, this toy model, the toy image model, is to be able to just to simply view, to simply understand what exactly is this radon nicodine operator L. I think this, this is the, not E well, but uh, it's the Q world. There is uh, just an error of typing. So to summarize it, the purpose of, a, of this oversimplified tool model is clearly establish the correspondences between these two quantification conventions. To be able to choose, I think about the debates or discussion of controversies about the EA image, just to choose what kind of framework we would like to use in, for example, for instance, debates about the efficiency of markets, the equilibrium of ethical issues about the role of models in society. So, for example, I think about the relationships between the arrollable securities in the context of the equilibrium general theory, the AD securities, and the market pricing kernel, the MPK market pricing kernel or stochastic discount factor of Lucas and Duffy. Because if you think about the issue of valuations, and a lot of times we can hear some narratives about the fictional valuation or the irrelevant valuation or financialized valuation and something like this. In terms of calculations, we are just dealing with the stochastic discount factor, which is only 
another way of thinking the algebra securities in an efficient market hypothesis. So this time model, I think, I hope, will allow to grasp precisely the background of a concept used in the way of thinking valuation and risk management, and what is what I call a fiction just behind the models. An example of fiction is given with the very well-known market consistent valuation or MCV. <coughs> the market consistent valuation is just a way of thinking that the market value is the just value, is the fair price. I don't know if it's true or not, but what I know is that the notion of fair value or market consistent valuation is closely linked with the notion of risk neutral pricing. And it's linked with the old way of thinking the beta is the KPM model of Sharp and Markowitz. For example, if the index, if a given index market, if the mean variance optimal tangent portfolio of Sharp, all the alphas will be equal, will be equal to zero. That means that it's not possible for a fund manager to think about a given overperformance if a market is um, calculated with a mean variance tangent portfolio. This is precisely an example of what McGoon called a metaphor. The model is thought as a metaphor to think about something important in the market equilibrium. That means that the market consistent valuation is a kind of metaphor based on the old way of thinking alpha and beta is the KPM framework. Another way of thinking this kind of issue is to think about financial models as exploratory fiction following the words of Elisa Bokovic in 2009, because these exploratory fictions are used for designing performative frameworks. And I think about the works of Mackenzie, because what is false at the beginning in a theory is built after in a practice by the, the effect of the performat performative issue of models. So my epistemic gain of this oversimplified uh, Tory image model will be an epistemic access to sophisticated concepts like, for example, market concern valuation, valuation, market pricing kernel, stochastic discount factor, all the securities, but without any mathematical complexity. And it will be possible after to, to compare the different representation formats of EMH and to be able to exhibit clearly what is fictional in these representations formats. And this is interesting because if we understand clearly what is fictional in these formats, it will be possible after to discuss and I think about the works, the work of Emiliano about uh, finance inside, outside, and all you, and you did about the role of finance for philosophy and specific of finance. Okay. What is a toy model? A toy model, in a very simple definition, is a highly idealized and extremely simple unrealistic model. And the key word is unrealistic. Because a toy model is unrealistic, the toy model allows to cognitively grasp a given complex phenomenon. Because of this unrealistic property, the toy model will be able to capture the main characteristics of a phenomenon without mathematical complications, without mathematical mists. So this is a toy model. There are Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of, of toy, toy models. What is called the embedded toy models and autonomous toy models. An embedded toy model is a toy model embedded in a given known theory, for example, KPM or risk control pricing. An autonomous toy model is just a toy model which is designed outside any given 
theory. So what I will do in this paper is to create an embedded toy model for e-image complex models. Why? Because the e-image complex model depend on the business context. I think about uh, a very large number of books. I think Boyle, Habart, Sotagliani, Regai, Zvetlova. We know uh, Catherine Zvetlova. And the business context is used to give a lot of details about the uh, complex EMH model, realistic, efficient, but complex. So I choose to design to create a toy EMH model embedded, embedded based on either the old fashioned way of thinking the EMH, meaning that the KPM view of uh, William Sharp, old but elegant, or elegant but old, up to you. And the risk control pricing based of two world of Horizon Krebs and Piska, same thing, modern and elegant, or elegant and modern. For my toy model, I will choose a very, very well known uh, framework. There is no novelty in my paper, but only a novelty in the way of presenting the toy of uh, different concepts. I will choose, I will use the, the binomial mathematical framework of Cox and Rubinstein dating back 1979. The advantage of choosing uh, this kind of simplicity is that I will be able to push to the edge all the calculations in dimension two. And this is very interesting, important and interesting because in dimension two, there is nothing like mathematical complexity in continuous time, nothing like mathematical complexity in multidimensional uh, arrow, et cetera, et cetera. That means that the optimal tangent index, I think about in the real world, where we sell 55 uh, euro stocks, uh, et cetera, the optimal tangent index will be precisely calculated only with addition and multiplications and division in dimension two. And it will be able to find two betas, like the beta, but in dimension two. More interesting, the radonic coding operator L, the state prime density, will be calculated very simply in dimension two. No mathematics, no, no stochastic calculus, no integration, only uh, just uh, multiplications and additions and uh, divisions. The transition from P to Q will be made in dimension two, so it will be very easy to, to precisely grasp what is behind the practice of finance on all the desks in the world when traders or uh, quants uh, Made an make an evaluation in the risk pricing way of thinking the world. And today, everyone works in the risk pricing world. And uh, our order gross securities will be exhibited in dimension two, which allow us to find the discount factor or market pricing kernel in dimension two. So it is possible to establish a connection between the general equilibrium theory, the hour level securities, and the CAPM and risk control pricing. That means to be able to connect the financial universe with the equilibrium theory in economics. And this is important because at the end of the story, it's possible to see that when an insurance company just made a very practical calculation for insurance contracts, for example, using the risk neutral pricing as a regulation describes it. Practically, that means that the very abstract notion of arrow securities is entering the real world of day-to-day -day practice. That means that when an insurance company or a mutual fund just uh, does a calculation for insurance contracts. The equilibrium general theory, the AGT, very abstract mathematical model, just is becoming real, is becoming real in the day-to-day -day society. 
So it's a way of understanding that the equilibrium general theory is very present, very actual, very active in our day-to-day -day activities. And maybe it could be the reason why a lot of people are not very satisfied with uh, the, the economy the economy today and the society today because of the presence, the hidden, the hidden presence of the our labor securities inside the uh, calculations of day-to-day -day insurance company, for example. It's uh, just an issue. Okay, I just check. Uh, I just, uh, uh, just I mean, I know I have uh, 30 minutes. I mean, no, we, we have time. I mean, don't worry. Okay. I mean, okay. the, the, the talk is supposed to to last uh, 40, 45 minutes. So perfect, perfect. If you need okay. time, you have it. Okay, EA image and arbitrage. Now we move to the definition of the EA image, if you're not going to this. The arbitrage was uh, already introduced in the election market hypothesis in the 60s because the sharp scapen, that means the capital asset pricing model of sharp, contains the notion of market equilibrium. So the arbitrage as a conceptual notion was already introduced in the 60s. But it's not before the 80s but the arbitrage as a notion was uh, mathematized with uh, Ross in 1966, Harrison Krebs and Orson Piska. And the mathematization of arbitrage is uh, a key moment of the financialization of finance, uh, economics and after society. The mathematization of arbitrage is a turning point for the day-to-day -day business practices in finance. So the articles, the papers of Harrison and Kretz on 1979 and also Pliska on 1981 are very important from this point of view. It's the reason why, in general, I say that it's not possible today to debate or to discuss, to discuss about the EAMH in finance without considering the new framework of EAMH, the framework based on the mathematization of arbitrage of the 80s. So there are two kinds of debates in the literature of non-specialists. I think about the issue of financial faults, sociologies, and, uh, and philosophy. Debates about the EA image as seen in the old-fashioned way of the 60s, and debates on EA image as understood with a new way of thinking arbitrage in the 80s. And I think there is a, a kind of, of missing debate about the understanding of Q, the original Warby, in the controversies about the EMH today. So what is important to understand is that the Asian market hypothesis, EMH, means arbitrage and complete markets, means Q martingale. The martingale we will see after a stochastic process with characteristic properties about the best uh, estimation of a future value. And this equivalence between EAMH in the old form and Q Martingale was made by the two very important papers of Delbert and Sachel Meyer in 1996 and Karadzas and Schreb in 1998. So in this global view, there are two representations of EAMH. One could be called the old-fashioned way of thinking EAMH, and one could be called the modern way of thinking EAMH. These two frameworks correspond because it's the same concept, which is uh, uh, alive in the background of these formats. But the way of understanding EAMH with one or one other framework has different consequences from the practices. If we think EAMH with the KPM and P, we will not do the same thing as uh, the thing that if we think EAMH in the Q world with the arbitrage pricing 
uh, view and the Mark Engels. Is the reason why with uh, F. Capello, we have called these two framework to quantification conventions. KPM and mean variance universe and Q and risk pricing universe. What is a quantification convention? A quantification convention following the definition we gave with F. Capello is could be thought as a methodology that allows financiers to work easily on a day-to-day -day business. It's a way of thinking globally the activity. A quantification convention has three dimensions, an epistemic one, a pragmatic one, and a political one. The epistemic dimensions is the framework, the knowledge, which will be adopted by a given academic community. And for example, in every finance uh, handbook today, you will find a chapter about the Q Martin Guns. That means that the epistemic dimension of EAMH allows every quant, every practitioner, every regulator to think about EAMH with Q Martin Guns. Is the reason why, for example, the European regulation about the efficient markets uh, define an efficient market with the notion of Q Martingales. And the reason why there is a kind of martingalization of real markets in Europe by using a given framework of regulation with Solvency II. We will see after. What is important in this epistemic dimension, a kind of, of shared knowledge for everybody, is that the mathematical descriptions of EAMH assume all the uniqueness of Q. And this uniqueness is very important, is the key point of the definition and the key point of a regulation, because if the, there is a uniqueness of a risk neutral probability Q, this uniqueness allows the market value to be the fair price, the fair value. So the fairness of markets is based on the uniqueness of risk neutral probability Q. So this is very important to be uh, able to have a shared knowledge which is the role of epistemic dimension of the quantification convention. The second dimension is a pragmatic one. That means that it's the, the shared knowledge is adopted by practitioners. If you are if you are a trader or a quant or a fund manager in your day-to-day -day practice, you will think about the market by using the risk neutral world. So if you want to have a, a, a debate or discussion with a philosopher who would like to, to, to ask for you what is the, the, the topic in the EMH issue, etc., you will think about the image by using the Q world. So this pragmatic dimension means that, that the epistemic view of EMH is adopted by everybody on markets. And it is became a dominant view in the financial industry. It's not possible today to think about the markets uh, and finance and to think about the financialization and to think about the ethical issue on market using the EAMH view of market. It's not possible to think about all this without thinking the uniqueness of Q as applied to day-to-day -day practice in the financial industry. And many popular techniques, I think about once again, uh, MCV market valuation, assume the EAMH with probability Q. And the notation used here is QEMH, because you could think about EAMH with the old fashioned way of, of thinking the arbitrage with KPM. And in this case, it will be, it will not be Q. EMH, but KPM EMH. 
Or you could think about the EMH with our level securities, and it will it will it will it, it would be AD EMH. The third dimension is a political one, and it is very interesting. I think about uh, uh, the work we do uh, with Emmanuel at the Ethics and Financial in Paris uh, for uh, about uh, eight years now, a long time ago. It's a way of uh, thinking the equilibrium in the regulation by using precisely the metrology embedded in the EMH with risk control pricing. That means that the policymakers have in mind, like a, a kind of, of background, a epistemic background, a kind of uh, view of the world in which the world is made with risk neutral pricing, with Q, with a uniqueness of Q. So if you are a regulator in Brussels, we think about the way of, for example, uh, trying to give a, a better finance for the society, and you will think about Q, and the, the, the only consequence will be the best way of finding justice for this world is to act for transforming markets with the Q probability. And this, this is very important to understand this uh, mental model behind the, the mind of the regulator. It's the reason why the risk neutral pricing underlies every prudential regulation today. I think about the Basel III of Solvency II. And so with the political dimension of the quantification convention, everybody can understand that the policymakers today can't think about finance outside the Q world. And this is very important because considering this kind of box of uh, of black box of Q, you will see that even if you would like to change the, uh, the, the framework of policymakers of the different regulations, it's not an issue of uh, something like greed of something like this. It's more an issue of framework. It's not possible if you are a policymaker or regulator to think outside the risk control pricing. And this is the reason why, with F. Capello, we, name, we named this a quantification a convention, very strong convention to uh, design the practical way of, uh, of the function of describing markets, epistemic, pragmatic, and political. So now we move to the, the toy EMH model and the description of the toy model. We have a toy economy, a toy economy with two companies for which uh, uh, analysts have elaborated the two scenarios, very classical, growth or decline. And we limit the economy of, with two companies just to keep the toy model but, but very simple and to preserve the mathematical simplicity of the example. On the date of the valuation, the share price of the company quoted on the stock exchange or its estimated values if the company are not quoted are 150 euros and 66 euros. This part of the table, the share price, defines exactly what Emiliano called in September and Roma, the epistemic value of the quotes. Because the two quotes of 150 and 66 contains the right parts of the table. That means the prospects in the pessimistic case and the optimistic case. What is important is that these prospects are calculated with probability P in the real world, the expected share value. In the first scenario, 
optimistic view of a future, the share value rises up to 200 and 120. And in the second scenario, the pessimistic view of future, the share value falls down 140 and 50. And this is the reason why 150 and 66 are called epistemic value of the quotes because these quotes are made with these prospects one and these probability here and there. So epistemic value of the quotes contains the prospects and the probability P. And this is very important just to see the, the link, the relation between the epistemic value of the quotes and the probability and the prospects. So the epistemic value of the quotes can be precise as follows. First, the two business prospects are assumed to be equally likely. Never scenario is preferred to the other. The probability of each scenario is therefore 50-50. The two probability of 0 0.50 are applied to the two forecast value with a probability distribution P of a future value of a company. And P is a probability of a phenomenon, P for phenomenon, or for the real world. And the two possible outcomes of the future value of the shares is weighted, are weighted by probability P, or it's a risky prospect. And this is the risk profile of the company, 140 or 200, nothing, uh, nothing more, nothing less, nothing more. This probability could be different and any other values will be possible as long as the sum of probability of each now is, remains equal to one. So it would be possible to have 60-40 of 20-80. At this stage, it's not very important. What is important is the relation between the epistemic value and the probability. If, for example, the probability was 40-60, it would be another kind of share price and another kind of epistemic value. What is important too is that there is no guarantee that the forecast future value, share value, have any connection with the reality of the economy. That means that it will be possible to imagine future forecast value, what, which would be not based on financial analysis calculation, but on rumor, for example, about uh, development in the companies without any business scenario calculation. Other example could be, uh, it could be noise and not information. It could be anything. And the issue is here, the notion of rational expectation, but at this stage of the model, it's not very important because what is important once again is the relation between the epistemic value of the quotes and the probability and the prospect. It could be noise, it could be uh, fictions, it could be anything at this stage and for the model is not very important. I suppose there is also uh, what is called a risk-free rate. A risk-free rate is just a rate of return whose value does not depend on the scenarios, unlike the risky prospects. That means that whatever the scenarios, the future value will be the same. With the money market, the economy, the share price is in this case one, and whatever the scenario, pessimistic prospect or optimistic prospect, the value, the the return will be the same, 2%, 2%. It's possible to compare here the, return, the returns of the company with the two prospects, pessimistic and optimistic, and we can see the difference. But in the case of the risk-free rates, it's precisely risk-free, meaning that there is no risk in this return. Okay, and this 
range between these two values defines the risk of the company A and the risk of company B. And calculate the probability P, it will be possible to find an expected value, an expected return of these two returns. Now we move to arbitrage. What is an arbitrage? An arbitrage is a trading strategy. A trading strategy that takes advantage of price inefficiencies. And in this case, a trading strategy allows to obtain a sure gain without bearing the slightest risk. And this is an arbitrage, a sure gain without bearing any kind of risk, even the slightest risk. So the markets is screened for arbitrage by exploring the possibilities of obtaining the risk-free, that means non-random rate, by using a mix of risky prospects bearing random rates. So here you have a random rates, and what you want to find is something, a trading strategy, that means an asset allocation between A and B, which allows you to find the same risk-free rates. And this is exactly the way of finding any kind of arbitrage on the markets, even in the more complicated cases. So we are now, we are now trying to look for a given arbitrage. We are searching for arbitrage in these toy markets. If there are price inefficiencies with a price system 150 and 66, in this case, hence, there will be opportunities to obtain a risk-free rate greater than two persons. So what we are going to do is to try to find a portfolio, an asset allocation between A and B. And that means holdings of the two companies, A and B, that allows to obtain a risk-free rate. No, we imagine uh, that we seek such a trading strategy and we aim to build a portfolio of A and B, such that whatever the future scenarios the value of this portfolio will be is 100,000 euro at date one. And in this case, if whatever the future scenarios, the value of portfolio is the same at date one, the portfolio will be risk-free. That means none, not exposed to a given risk, given market risk. And now we are going to, to find the holdings of companies A and B. Some calculations. I think it's not very useful to just to, to see in details the, cal the calculation, but the idea is very simple. If we denote theta A and theta B, the quantities of, of holdings of the shares A and B at date zero, the value of the portfolio at date zero, denoted V zero, will be just theta A times 150, the price, the epistemic value of quotes at date zero, plus theta B times 66, the epistemic value of quotes at date zero. So at date zero, with the epistemic value of the two quotes, 150 and 66, we will find the value of the portfolio, the V0. At date one, the final value will be V1. In the pessimistic prospect, 
you just have to put the prospects with uh, the pessimistic values, 140 and 50, and the prospect with optimistic values for V1, 200 and 120. No, just recall that what you want is to be able to have the same price at date one. As you want to obtain the same price of 100,000 euro in the two cases of prospects, pessimistic and optimistic, it results it's two uh, system of two equations for pessimistic and optimistic uh, prospect, this precise system. In this case, it is the pessimistic prospect uh, on the toy model, and in this case, the optimistic one. And in the two cases, you want to find the same price at the end. And in this case, your portfolio will be risk-free. So you have to find theta A and theta B to solve this system of two equations with two unknown variables, theta A and theta B. Just this system. If we do this, we will find that the theta theta A is 1029.41 shares of company A, and theta B is minus 882.45 shares of company B. And the negative sign of theta B means that practically we have to short the shares of company B. If we do this, meaning that if we have uh, an asset allocation with one, this, this figure for A and this figure for B, you can easily check that in the two cases, it's magic, you will find the same value for a portfolio. Whatever the possible outcomes, the resulting portfolio will be valued at 100,000 euros on dates one. That means that the portfolio is risk-free with these two value for two values for theta A and theta B. No, we know that at date zero, the value of the portfolio is V0, is 1029.41 shares times 150, minus 882.35 times 66 for the company B, equals 96.5 1,176.47 euros for V0. This is the value of a portfolio at that zero in the case of the asset allocation obtained for solving the equation of risk-free portfolio. That means that, this is very interesting result, the resulting risk-free rates for this portfolio is just given by the division of 100,000 over uh, 96, 176.47 one, uh, euro, 47 euro minus one, that means 3.98 persons. 3.98 persons is the risk-free rate of the portfolio. Recall that the money market is two persons. That means that you can find with an arbitrage a risk-free rate which is higher than the money market return. That means that it would be enough to borrow from the money markets at 2% the amount needed to buy this portfolio to obtain a new return, sure return 
of 3.98 without any risk. And then to cash in the difference in return. This situation is typically an, an anomaly in the market since it would be possible to make very large gains without taking any risk. It, it is called a free lunch with the financier jargon. That means that it would be enough to buy very large quantities of A, to borrow the money to finance the purchase, and to sell as much B as necessary. And such an anomaly represents an inconsistency in the price formation according to the target price forecasts. That means that something, we don't know why, we don't know what, sorry, is not reflected in the prices. In other words, the epistemic value of the quotes here, 150 and 66, is that clearly what is could be considering the prospect, the probability, and the risk-free rate of two percent? There is something wrong. Where is a free lunch? It's very simple. Just buy one. 1029.41 shares of company A, A at 150 euros and short, and just to short, 882.35 shares of company B at 66 euros. Just calculate the resulting cash flow minus theta A times 150 plus theta B times 66, and you will find minus. 96, 176.47 euros. It is negative, hence we have to fund it by borrowing on the market. The risk free rate is 2%. At the end of the period, one refunds this amount plus 2% interest. One repurchases the shares of B and sells the TTV shares of company A. And the zero risk gain resulting from this arbitrage is exactly. 1,900 euros. To be more clear, to be clearer, that means that it's possible to make 1,900 euros with zero euro spent. And it is exactly what is called a free lunch. Now, considering this anomaly, it's possible to implement an arbitrage on markets by buying the shares of company A on the markets and selling the shares of company B. Buying the shares of company A will have effect of putting upward pressure on the price and selling the shares of company B will have opposite effect. So you buy company A, you sell company B, and doing this, the price begin to move. For the model, we suppose that only the price of company B will change. This may mean that something of company B was not fully taken account, taken account in the valuation. That means the epistemic quote value of the quote of B is not clear. The price of B will fall until its new value is no is low enough that the arbitrage operation no longer yields a definite return higher than that of existing risk-free investments. If you write mathemat mathematically this condition, we will find that the new arbitrage price for B is not 66 euros as the first epistemic uh, value of the quote, but 63.89 euro. This is because at date one, we have to find 100,000 euro. So at date zero, you just made the operation by dividing with 2%, which is a risk-free rate. And it is one equation with only one unknown variable B. Now, we are going to play with the EMH model after 
having found what is the condition for the markets to be arbitrary. First, everybody knows the notion of present value. We are now, con we are now considering the present value equation. That means the way of finding the value, considering the prospects. Just recall that the toy economy is given here. We, we, are, we have two prospects, pessimistic and optimistic, two companies, one probability P here, and uh, two share prices. And now the new price is not 66, but 63.89. So we begin with the old quotes before arbitrage, 150 euros and 66 euros. These two quantities are given by a present value calculation. And the present value calculation is an expected future value discounted at the rate of 13.33%. In this equation, 150 euros is exactly the result of 140 pessimistic prospect plus 200 optimistic prospect times the probability P of the real world divided by, by one plus the rate of return. And similar logic can be used with company B. We find the same present value equation. Now, it will be possible to, to change the discount rates, to change the price, the share price at that zero, to change the discount rise, or to change the probability. If, for example, we change the probability P by replacing 50-50 by 70-30, another kind of scenario another kind of prospects, because prospects are including the probability. We have to find a new discount rate. That means that with this new probability P, 70, 30, it is necessary to have a discount rate, which is 5.33% instead of 13, 33. And this is very important because what we see in this very simple case is that there is a relationship between the probability distribution in the real world and the expected rate of return. That means that the epistemic value of the quotes is linked to a probability distribution. Recall that the epistemic value of quotes is just given here. And this epistemic value is linked with the probability distribution in the real world, the world of probability P. Now we can calculate the same present value because the market is a market, the price are the prices, with another probability, the probability Q. The question is, if we specify a new rate of return here, what should be the probabilities of the scenarios? It's a very simple issue because we have, we have no mathematical complexity in this case. And the equation is here. I just check my phone no, uh, because there is discussion. No, it's okay. Uh, I just check the discussion. Ah, okay. Okay, okay, Miliano. So uh, if we fix the discount rate to Two person, we will find that the probability is 78.22. So expected return of company A is now a risk-free rate 
And this is very unusual because the company is a risky assets, it's a risky prospect. So in this case, the investor does not demand the risk premium for buying a company A. That this would mean that the investor is not affected by risk taking, he becomes risk neutral. And the reason why this new probability is called the risk neutral probability and it is a Q. It is a present value calculated in a Q world. That means that the informational market equilibrium is written in this case in the dual world using the probability Q in the asset pricing equation. And I will end my talk just uh, now because it's, it was too long for the, the seminar and very sorry, but it could be possible to, to debate some, some um, conclusion after. What is very important to see, and I, I, I will conclude this uh, results. It's always possible to calculate a, prob uh, a probability with a risk neutral rates, the two person here, two person here, and uh, uh, this is value of the first probability 25, 75, 25, and 78, 22. If you calculate probability Q with the company A, you will find in this case 78 and 22, and for company B, you will find 75 and 25. That means that before the arbitrage, there are two probability, risk neutral probabilities Q. But after arbitrage, you will find that only one probability Q appears, 78, 22. That means that once the market is arbitrage and is magic, the probability Q becomes unique. With, and this is the uniqueness of the probability Q in an arbitrage market. Okay, so uh, I will conclude this, these results because um, I think it's one hour. And uh, what I would like to just to emphasize here is that the arbitrage in the markets has a very strong effect to uh, render the probability Q unique. So I have to I have to 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 stop here. I am very sorry, but uh, I think it was uh, too long. And uh, okay, I think we we can discuss now about the, the slides presented. Thank you anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christian, for this talk and. Uh... We can now open the, the debate and uh, so people can raise their hands in the right man or speak directly in, in the video. Okay. Okay, yes, probably. Uh, I mean, I have questions. So uh, probably I, I could start and break the ice and. Uh, so, oh no! Oh, sorry. We have Brian Brian Pitts that uh, has raised. Yes. So, thank you, Brian. Yes. Hello. Thank you for your uh, for your illuminating talk. Um, I was wondering if you uh, have a slide on the radon nicodyne theorem uh, in this example. Perhaps you were planning to show that and ran out of time. Uh, that would be interesting. It's not a it's, it's not a disagreement, it's a, it's a request for more. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, warm comments and questions. I have a slide, I just showed you the slide. Uh, where is it? Uh, Maybe that was it and I didn't, break it. I didn't make the connection, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, do you see my, my screen? Yes. Uh, here, this is the beta, capem, capem. This is the radonicodine. 
It's why it, the Ralonica Inn is uh, found as a state pride density uh, here, L equal Q over P. And uh, this is the equation given, um, which gives the stochastic con factor or market passing channel alpha equaling L over one plus R, or R is the risk free uh, rate of two persons. That means that in this toy model, one over one plus R times Q of omega over P of omega, for the given state of the economy, the stochastic con factor is equal to the, to the SPD, the state pride density radon nickelin operator Q over P, adjusted by the risk free weights. That means that in the pessimistic case, the market pricing kernel alpha equals 1.5359. And in the optimistic case, it's equal 0 0.4248. But in the consequences you find here, the multiple representations of EMH, and it's possible to see these equations as metaphors in the sense of McGoon or for, the, for mental models, which will be after, uh, produced by performativity, a real world financialized with a P world and Q world. This is the KPM EMH, the system of KPM. This is the Q and market pricing kernel with a value here containing the radonicodine uh, operator Q over P. It's, I know it's, it's quite technical and very fast, but uh, just to answer to your question, yes, I have a, a slide, I had a slide about this. And just to end, this is the, uh, how the boy securities calculated with uh, Q over one plus R. Uh, once again, we find the radonicodin operator inside this equation. And at the end, this is the, the final table at the end. This is the toy model global, the toy image model with the real world probability P, 50-50, the money markets, two person, two person for the two cases, in that means a risk-free return. The company A, the company B, here you find the epistemic value of the quotes after arbitrage with the forecasts and prospects 140, 250, 120. The risk neutral probability Q in the two situations, pessimistic and optimistic, 78 and 22. The radonicodine operator, the state price density L equal Q over P. The radonicodine operator is 1.56 and 0 0.5043. The market pricing kernel alpha, 1.53, but there is a small difference due to the uh, one over one plus R. And what is very interesting, the arrowable securities in the two case with the value of arrowable securities 1001 and the value that T equals zero. And this is again what Emiliano called the epistemic value of the quotes of the Arrow de Bruce securities because of the two prospects are very simple, one zero and zero one. And this is a, at the end, the, the, the result of the toy image model to be able to understand exactly the correspondences between Q, P, L, alpha, Arrow de Bruce securities, the price, the economy and the risk free markets. That means the correspondences between the old framework of CAPEN and the new framework with risk neutral pricing. This is the this table. You see, old framework of EMH 1970, new framework with Q, the Rison Pisca 81, the equivalence in the P world with the market pricing kernel, and the general equilibrium theory with our level securities. And this results is very simple to, to obtain because that there is nothing like mathematical complexity and no, uh, no stochastic processes and no stochastic calculus.
That's very nice. Thank you. I've seen some of this material in a more abstract way, but I like the connections that you have drawn and the uh, the uh, concrete uh, quality of it all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, because it is exactly what I'm trying to do, is to be able to give some framework without uh, any mathematical complexity. Exact. Exactly. Good. Okay, I don't know if there are other questions from Brian or I mean some somebody in the in, in the audience. Okay, so maybe uh, yes, I, I have a question for for, for you, uh, Christian. So let, let's see my, my first question. Uh, the, the first question is about the the two the two models, and I, I mean. Do we have uh, some criteria to to choose one of them, or uh, so, so? My question is about uh, what, what are I mean the condition under which you uh, you employ one of the two models? If you can okay. say something about this, um, thank you. Okay, I will show you my last. Uh, slide. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, here. You know, this is uh, exactly a choice between uh, two performative metaphors. You have to choose a given model considering uh, the model like a metaphor, uh, hyper-reality of, for example, Baudria, hyper-real finance. So the issue is, in terms of ethical issues, is it possible that a given metaphor be dangerous or deceptive? And uh, you have to do the choice. And uh, for example, if you are a fund manager, you will, you will uh, choose the the whole framework of image with KPM and beta. If you are a trader or a quant, you will choose a new framework. But the open issue here is, is it possible to find an ethical criteria to, to be able to, to say that one framework is more dangerous than the other? I think it's an open issue. Maybe, maybe I would say that, maybe I would say that the, the Q world, it's only a mathematical trick. You feel you just uh, move from one to other. But maybe, I'm not sure, the Q way of thinking the finance could be dangerous because it's, it gives you something like a delusion on the world. Because with this Q pricing, the notion of risk has disappeared. So in the Q world, there is no more risk. And if there is no more risk, what will be the reason of not, find, not looking for high returns in terms of prudence? So maybe the, the Q uh, view of finance could be uh, could be dangerous for this reason, for giving the illusion of uh, an economy without risk. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Th th thank you. So, so um, if I understand, the, I mean your your reconstruction of the the toy models uh, uh, correctly, uh, can can we say that? Uh, uh those models in uh, are also counter performative in the sense that they are produce they can produce and perform a reality which is uh, different uh from the one i put is uh, uh, conjectured by by the models in the sense that uh, we are producing uh, freelances uh, and uh, marketing efficiencies if I understand, I mean your 
your point correctly. Mm, I agree. Uh, I made a chapter in a, in a book about this issue precisely. If uh, hypothesis, if assumption is dangerous in the using the, the, the classification of uh, Austin between uh, a locutionary parts of the theory, illocutionary and perlocutionary, you know, the three kinds of uh, discourse. If we consider that uh, the Q description of the world is like a locutionary parts of a discourse, what the description is containing. If you consider that the regulation is the illocutionary part of the discourse because uh, with Basel III or Solvency II, the Q way of thinking becomes reality. In this case, it will appear some unexpected effects, that means conda performative, which will be the perlocutionary dimension of the discourse. So I agree, it, it can create some counter-performative effects or perlocutionary per uh, dimension of the discourse if the assumptions are dangerous. And uh, in my opinion, uh, if we use the Q way of thinking the risk, we will create by regulation a counter-performative effect or a perlocutionary uh, effects of uh, the the mathematics of finance, for example, black swans. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, that's, that, that's a very interesting uh, um, side of, of your, I mean, of your, of your talk. And I don't know if there are other questions from from the audience. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, otherwise, like I think I think we can stop here and thank. Christian, one more time for being here today with us. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh... okay, thank you.